Let's get to uh, Larry Kudlow joining us this morning on the back of the jobs number. Labor Department says that job growth did slow in November. 155,000 jobs added for the month. A touch below expectations. Unemployment steady at 3.7. Larry, good morning. Good to have Mo you. Morning, Carl. Thank you. Uh, so our three-month average goes to 170. Our weakest goods producing print since March. Uh, ADP yesterday suggested job growth has peaked. Has it? Oh, I don't know if it's peaked. I mean, you, we're running, um, what, 200,000, 206,000 a month uh, for the entire year through November. That's pretty good. You know, last month was 250. This month was 155. I was really impressed with the manufacturing number, uh, which was, what, about 27? Yeah, 27,000. This has been a blue-collar recovery, uh, the best blue-collar job performance since the mid-1980s and also the best blue collar wage performance. So I, I, don't, I don't know, I think it's a very decent number. Uh, month on month, average hourly earnings were revised down from two tenths uh, to one tenth. Market's gonna like that news, can you blame them? Well, I don't know, look, uh, I, I like higher wages, by the way. I, I like working people getting higher wages. I like everybody, I even like broadcasters getting higher wages. So I, I think, um, you know, we're 3.1% average hourly earnings year on year. Um, times hours worked, you're probably running about near 5% uh, as an income proxy for, you know, mainstream workers. I think that's very, very good. You got 3.1%, as I said, you got 3.7% unemployment, Carl, as you know. Actually, that number, you could almost tweak it to 3.6%. It was very close on the rounding error. So I, I think it's a solid number. But Larry, Jim, how you been? Good, good, buddy. How are you, Jimmy? Okay, so I think that when I read this number, I actually think the president made a very good case uh, to say, hey, listen, let's let it play out. Let's have all these people be employed. Do you think it's right that an elected official, the president, makes those statements? Because they turned out to be right. Guy's a good forecaster. I don't have any problem with it. I mean, I think a lot of things are coming uh, home. I'm reading uh, all these Fed officials are now saying that the inflation rate is actually coming down a bit, the economy is growing, uh, the supply side uh, tax cuts and deregulation is working, there's capital deepening, which is great for productivity and real wages. Um, sounds to me like the Fed spokespeople are signaling maybe one more uh, rate hike in December later this month, and maybe no more for quite some time or maybe they won't move uh, this month. But again, the president, as I've said a million times, he has a lot of experience as a businessman and investor, so he knows his stuff. Well, let me ask you, you were down in uh, Argentina. I find it disturbing. You taught me the notion of red China rising. And red China rising is not necessarily a blessing for our interests, our national interest. When I see who uh, the Canadians willing to comply and arrest a CFO, that means it's serious business. The Canadians don't do our bidding. Should we be more concerned about the national interest that we have at stake, or should we be concerned about the profits of businesses? Well, look, um, on the Huawei story, um, we, uh, we have warned them for quite some time. Uh, violating the Iranian sanctions. Uh, as I, I don't know every detail of this story, but as I understand it, this, you know, we did ask the Canadian government to do this, and they have been very cooperative. We appreciate that very much. And look, we have these sanctions on Iran. That runs against our policy. Uh, why shouldn't we enforce that? I don't know, by the way, that that necessarily spills over into the trade talks, to be honest with you. Um, at the moment, I rather doubt it. We can get to the trade talks in a moment. But in terms of the profits of these companies, Jimmy, national security always takes precedence, and I think this is a clear example of it. All right, well, let's, uh, Larry, it's David, let's get to the trade talks. Uh, I guess, hey, why don't you think it may not spill over into the trade talks, that being the, the arrest of the Huawei executive? Well, look, I, I think it's a separate track, number one. Um, as again, I've said, they're, they're, you know, we've warned them. This kind of goes, to a lot of technical issues, or shall I say technology-related issues, we would like China's cooperation. You can't break the law. If you break the American law, you break the Canadian law, uh, you've got to pay the consequences of that. Um, that was the case with other uh, companies and will continue to be the case. These are issues of national security. But look, 
the bigger picture here is extremely promising. That's the point I want to make. I tend to be on the optimistic side of the story. I was there. Uh, I, I heard the chemistry. I saw the chemistry between President Trump and President Xi. Perhaps uh, as important or more so, the um, documents back and forth, the cables back and forth. We've been working on them for several weeks. Uh, it looks to me like we will accomplish quite a bit. Now, before I run away with optimism, I want to tell you, trust but verify. I mean, I was on the phone with Ambassador Lighthizer just a few moments ago, and he reiterated to me, all this has to be monitored. All this has to be clearly uh, enforced. Uh, promises uh, made have to be promises kept. So I don't want to go too far, but I would say, given the China announcements of the last couple of days, I believe those were Wednesday and Thursday, that talked about immediate movement, uh, certainly in the commodities area, energy, agriculture, industry, and also perhaps the car tariffs, which I think will come down uh, rapidly. And then their willingness to discuss uh, the main issues, I think the most important family jewel issues for the USA, and that is um, IP theft, uh, forced uh, technology transfers, uh, cyber hacking, cyber theft, uh, going into commercial companies. Those are the key, key issues. Now, they have a willingness to talk. That was in the cables and the notes we have. Uh, we'll see. And, um, of course, it all has to be verified. So, you know, color me optimistic. So how would you characterize the chances that success will be reached in the next 90 days? Well, I think there'll be a lot of success reached in the next 90. I can't say everything. It's hard to forecast, David. But uh, the president has indicated if there's good, solid movement, and some good action, uh, he, might, he might be willing to extend the 90 days. We'll have to see on that. It's going to be up to him and his um, discussions with President Xi. But I think we're going to get a lot done. You know, I'll tell you a quick anecdote about this whole story. Um, Bob Lighthizer and Steve Mnuchin and I were uh, discussing, we had two separate meetings with uh, Liu He, the uh, vice premier and the top economics guy. We, we know him. And, we know his uh, top deputies very well. And we saw them Friday, we saw them Saturday before the dinner. And one of the things that was so interesting to me was Liu's statement to us that things could change and that China wanted them to change, quote unquote, immediately. Now that's a word I had never heard from China because uh, they never say yes to anything so far in our bargaining this year. And I asked him, what does immediately mean? He said, basically, immediately means immediately. And that's a good sign. And if you look carefully at the China Commerce Department's uh, public statements on Wednesday and Thursday, you also see that word immediately, not only in terms of, um, of uh, opening up markets and lowering tariffs for various commodities and so forth, but also in the discussions on the key technology-related issues. So look, I can't make a promise here. Um, I'm part of the group that's discussing this. We will wait and see whether it's satisfactory to the president and so forth. But again, I like the word immediately, and I think um, President Trump himself is rather optimistic right now. Larry, uh, on Huawei, uh, Washington Post has a piece about executives and whether or not they may reconsider any trips to China that they have. What would you tell them? You mean American executives? American executives, yeah. Um, if I were they, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stop business or disrupt business just on the basis of Huawei, all right? If I were they, uh, I would try to help us with all the Chinese officials regarding these trade talks and trade openings and tariff reduction and non-tariff barriers and so forth and so on, and of course the technology issues. So I, I, they should join us. I don't necessarily think they have to disrupt all their business. But look, you know, the center of this discussion, I just want to make this, is, I think, a very important point. I saw it at the G20 plenary sessions. Um, we've heard it from a lot of top American business people. Uh, I was at the BRT yesterday speaking on these subjects. The center of gravity here has really shifted, okay? There's no longer a debate about whether or not China needs major reform. There is no longer a debate about the IP theft issues. There is no longer a debate about the forced technology transfers. 
or the cyber interference to American uh, commercial operations. There is unity that these problems have to be resolved. And I saw the same thing at the G20. Um, country after country would talk about the need for major reforms of the WTO, for example, and major changes in China's behavior. And I think that had an impact on President Xi. All right, as I watched him at our dinner, which, I don't know, went three hours or something, um, he and Trump, you know, going back and forth, I think that President Xi was much more accommodative than anything I've seen or heard uh, up to then, and I think it's spilling over. So all I'm saying is on this, Carl, the rest of the world, I call it a trade coalition of the willing, the rest of the world is now essentially agreeing with the United States. There's no disagreement here. I think China feels that heat, and that's why I think, among other reasons, they will be more cooperative and accommodative. I hope so. But again, to echo Ambassador Lighthizer, uh, trust but verify, we've got to see the timetables met, the enforcement procedures met, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, Larry, you introduced me to a man named Peter Navarro, who I think is a brilliant man. I think he knows more about the way China acts and thinks than anyone I've, I've ever talked to. Uh, he talks about the 2025 domination plan. Isn't it the time for the Chinese to take that back? And Vice President Pence has been remarkable, both at the APEC conference and also in the October 4th Hudson Institute speech, talking about the notion of Belt and Road and talking about the notion of Chinese forced hegemony. Isn't it time for them to renounce some of their worldwide domination? I, you know I'm not joking. That's what Navarro calls it. Uh, isn't it time to go, back, to go back to what they said they'd do when, when they joined the World Trade Organization in December of 2001 and renounce some of these what I regard as being war, warlike comments against our great nation? Well, I don't like warlike comments. I agree. Uh, Peter Navarro is an old friend and um, a valued member of our trade team and so forth. Um, Jimmy, I would, look, I would be very happy, very pleased, and I think our group would, and I think President Trump would, to see China make these crucial tr uh, changes in the trading area and in the WTO. I mean, look, for example, uh, China is no longer an undeveloped country. Can we agree on that? So that uh, most favored nations, which gives them tariff powers they shouldn't have anymore, that's got to be stopped. That's got to be part of a WTO reform, which, as I said earlier, almost every other major country in the world supports. That's got to be reformed. And China has itself, at least in passing, talked about WTO reform. We will learn more as time goes on to see if their attitude is changing. I, I hope it does. Uh, Larry, finally, uh, to transition to an issue I think we're going to be discussing a lot in the new year, which is the growing budget deficit and how it may impact your legislative priorities in the administration. Um, isn't it time to admit that the tax cuts uh, are not going to pay for themselves? No, I think quite the opposite. Of course, you and I have disagreed about this for, I don't know, what, two or three years, David? Maybe going back longer than that. Um, I, I think the tax cuts are working. I think nominal GDP is much higher than people expected. Uh, even the CBO has acknowledged as much. Um, I think you're going to see the budget deficit come way down as a share of GDP because of faster uh, economic growth. I mean, you know, we're in a really good spot here, if you ask me. Uh, I hear all this pessimism coming off Wall Street. Uh, okay, I understand corrections and whatnot. But look, um, we're getting tremendous increases in growth. You know, we're running 3% year on year, and nobody thought that would be possible, and we're there. I mean, I think for all of President Trump's quarters, uh, except the very first quarter when he just came into office, I think the growth rate has been 3.1% at an annual rate uh, for something like seven quarters. Meanwhile, the inflation you rate... You really think the budget deficit's really going to start falling next year, Larry? You really well, I, do? I mean, I, revenues I, don't seem to be pointing to that. CBOE doesn't seem to be pointing towards that. Uh, what underlies that, even if we maintain, let's call it 3%? Yes, I think, the, I think you're going to see uh, bigger increases in revenues. The president has already talked about a very tough budget, 5% uh, reduction across the board for non-defense accounts. Uh, that's a very tough budget. And I think the combination of spending limits and economic growth uh, will do the trick. I mean, the deficit as a share of GDP will come down a lot in the next few years. I don't want to predict exactly, but that's the view. And as I was saying before,
the supply side tax cuts and the rollback of regulations and opening of energy and so forth, um, we're producing very significant growth with virtually no inflation. Inflation is coming in under uh, the Fed's target, uh, which may be a uh, cause for their reassessment. So look, I think it's a very good position to be in. And I do think we have to spend good time trying to hold back uh, budget spending. I agree about that part. Larry, we didn't get to the yield curve uh, or the trade deficit. Um, next time you're in town, stop by the set, okay? I'd love to talk yield curve. Love to do it, Carl. Thank you very much, Jimmy, David. Thank you, folks. Good to see you, Larry. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Larry Kudlow.